billion trillion million billion trillions of orbiting snowballs orbiting snowballs orbiting a flat fact a flat fact the realm do you know what the realm is a story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. At the third test, it will be 9, 50, and 10 seconds. At the third test, it will be 10, 27, and 10 seconds. In a world where humans, in a world where humans have become the only life form on Earth that is out of sync with the light, in a time where humans forgot that they were children of the light, be it lux, let them be light. Does it matter that humans are the only life form that is out of sync with the light? Birds migrate, bears hibernate, flowers flower and set their seed based on the amount of light hours in a day. Leading up to the spring equinox in Australia, birds are making nest buds are forming on the flowers. Two times a year at the equinox, the sun is 90 degrees overhead at the equator. Every autumn and every spring. How do the animals and plants know the difference? Watch nature. Nature knows the difference. How do the plants and animals know the difference between autumn and spring? If you didn't have a calendar or some way to look it up, would you know which was the spring and which was the autumn equinox? Would you know when the equinox was? This video is continuing on from my series, Gods and Monsters, The Time Apocalypse, but it's not a chapter. It's more of an addendum, an extra bit. But this addendum will also not be brought to you by a magnet. And if you did not notice, the information in the previous chapters did not require the use of a telescope and neither will the chapters going forward. None of us should ever get lost. Not lost at sea, not lost in the desert, not lost in the bush. So I have a few things to cover in this addendum what astronomy is and what astronomy is not. Celestial navigation on Earth simplified. We'll talk about that southern star movement. And I will be talking about the reset of the seasons. Did you know the seasons had a reset? If time was reset 150 years ago, would you know? What about 25 years ago? Would you have noticed? What about 10 years ago? What about five years ago? Would you have noticed if time was reset five years ago? What about the people thrice upon a time ago? Do you think that they would have noticed? Did you learn astronomy at school, primary school, secondary school? If you went to school in the English speaking West, probably not. The same answer would apply if you went to a government mandated school anywhere on earth. You might have learned a little cosmology, but you did not learn astronomy. So where did you learn anything you know or think you know about astronomy? Where did you learn anything you know about the sky above your head? And have you learned anything at all? Let's look at thrice upon a time ago. We won't go as far back as the people who carved it in stone, but we'll go a ways back. When I say the word universe, what picture does the word universe make in your mind? Now let me split the word up. Uni, verse. Uni means one, and a verse is of poetry. The poetry of the one. Poetry has a rhythm a tempo, a timing. Thrice upon a time ago, the seven liberal arts were taught. They were divided into the threefold trivium of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the fourfold quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. 
Did you learn the seven liberal arts from primary school through to secondary school, university? No, the education system has changed. Astronomy is of the fourfold quadrivium, so this is my focus. Quadrivium, four branches of mathematics, place where four roads meet. The four subjects of the quadrivium are connected by mathematics. Arithmetic is the study of numbers and their relationship to each other. Geometry is the examination of how numbers relate to each other spatially. Music is the study of the relationship of numbers temporally. And astronomy is the study of numbers in both space and time. Now, when the people before are talking about space, they are not thinking out of space. As I've stated numerous times, the people before are not measuring time by standing on the outside looking in. The study of numbers in both space and time. The space is the distance between two points. The measurement of the space in between two points and the time taken to travel between those two points. The mastery of the quadrivium, the mastery of the four branches of mathematics was a prerequisite meaning required beforehand, the mastery of the four subjects of the quadrivium were a prerequisite for the study of philosophy and theology. Let me say that in a different way. The mastery of the four mathematical fields, the mastery of arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy were acquired before you could go off to theoretical imagination land into fields termed today, for example, a theoretical physicist, astrophysicist, or become a priest. In order to theorize why something is happening, you have to ascertain what is happening in the first instance. Astronomy is not philosophy. It is not theology. It is not cosmology. Astronomy is not astrology. Astronomy is not based on probability or possibility. And astronomy is not science. Astronomy is mathematical. The four subjects of the quadrivium are mathematics, not science. Science uses mathematics to formulate theories. Astronomy is not a theoretical field. Astronomy is mathematics. Astronomy has always been the mathematics of the sky and time. Astronomy cannot be assimilated into science. Astronomy is not guesswork, believing or imagining what you think it is. Astronomy is not magic and it is not frozen in time. Astronomy is mathematics on a long count. Moon phases are not predicted. It is an astronomical calculation based on a known cycle. Eclipses are not predicted. It is an astronomical calculation based on the known cycle. Meteor showers are not predicted. This is also an astronomical calculation based on a known cycle. Let's just digress on meteor showers for a minute. The name of these fireworks in the sky was once called aerolites. And hereafter, that's how I shall refer to them, unless I forget. Aerolites, lights of the air. Do you know how many aerolite showers there are every year? Do you know out of which constellations they emanate from? If you paid attention to the aerolite showers for one year, what might you learn? If you had tracked the aerolite showers since 1998, what might you have learned? Astronomy is mathematics. So as we see since forever ago, astronomy is mathematics. Now let's look at celestial navigation. So, the first step in celestial navigation is to remove the imaginings, the ghost, the apparition, the apparent position of a celestial body. Let's look at the meaning of the word apparent. This example shows two meanings which are contrary to each other. One means it's real, the other means it's imaginary. The word apparent causes confusion among the people. 
So going forward in the learning of celestial navigation and the time apocalypse, we shall just delete the word apparent from our minds. It is contradictory and serves us no purpose. We shall instead call the position of a celestial body by the name it is supposed to be called, that being the geographical position, or the GP for short. The geographical position of a celestial body. This book, Celestial Navigation for Yachtsmen, is written by Mary Blewett. The first edition was published in 1950. This book and its later editions is still published today. The hardback edition, which I bought about six years ago, and I will be quoting from, published by Sanford Maritime. The author Mary Blewett was involved with sailing for most of her life, formerly a top ocean racing navigator, as well as secretary of the Royal Ocean Racing Club for a number of years. She was also chairman of the Racing Rules Committee of the Royal Yachting Association. The foreword to her book is by Captain John Illingworth of the Royal Navy. Captain Illingworth and his crew won the inaugural Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race, which was very much to their surprise as they had gone through a Force 9 storm according to the Royal Australian Air Force. 50 foot waves and the main sail was ripped and repaired out at sea. Illingworth was a master tactician, a keen ocean racer, crew member Ray Richmond recalled. We plotted every mile of the way Every half hour of every watch, we had to put down our estimated position, which Illingworth or the navigator checked on the course. They arrived after six days at sea to find that they were the first boat in and had won the very first Sydney to Hobart yacht race. Sailing the ocean requires skills. Skills like those two people. It is a little bit more life and death important out there to know where you are. If something was to happen, it would be no good radioing for help with the position of apparently where you think you are. No, you need to be giving your GP your geographical position. One lightning strike in your radio and all your navigation gizmos could go poof. Now it's just you, your crew and your boat. This book is from the time of theory and practice. Theory was the technical side, not imaginings and you would put that technical side into practice, as in, do it. Chapter one of Celestial Navigation for Yachtsmen, the first paragraph, I quote, before the theory of sight can be understood, there are certain facts about the earth which must be thoroughly grasped and certain terms which must be learned, end quote. Second paragraph, quote, we navigate by means of the sun, the moon, the planets and the stars. Forget the earth spinning round the sun with the motionless stars infinite distances away and imagine that the earth is the centre of the universe and that all the heavenly bodies circle slowly around us. The stars keeping their relative position while the sun, moon and planets change their positions in relation to each other and to the stars. This pre-Copernican outlook comes easily as we watch the heavenly bodies rise and set and is a help in practical navigation." End quote. So did you hear this? You can only celestial navigate by forgetting the earth is spinning around the sun and imagine that the earth is the center of all. Hello, this is the archaic view of the earth the archaic view of those thrice upon time ago. You know, the ones who learnt the quadrivium of mathematics from childhood, the ones who mapped earth and the sky. Let's see what Mary Blewett means by certain facts about the earth, which must be thoroughly grasped. As a reminder, astronomy is not science, it is mathematics. This is not a model of the sky. This is a mathematical plot of the stars in the sky, the longitude and latitude of lights in the sky, the geographical position of celestial objects. 
And thanks to the people from thrice upon a time ago, we have a long count. The Southern Star Rotation. Do the stars in the Southern Hemisphere rotate in the opposite direction? I have heard people say this has been confirmed by time lapses of star trails. Anyone know at exactly what latitude the stars begin to rotate in the opposite direction down here in the land of Oi Oi G'day mate? Shouldn't this latitude of a change of rotation in the sky be an astronomical calculation that should be used when calculating moon phases, the sun positions, twilight times, etc, etc for the southern hemisphere? Is there? No, there is not. I've been right around Australia. I grew up in the tropical north. I lived in Western Australia for a few years where I started primary school. And I remember a lot, but I remember the sunsets over the ocean. Everywhere I have been in Australia, the sun rose in the east and set in the west. I was in Tasmania this year for the eclipse of the June solstice 2021. The sun rose in the east and set in the west. I'm sure if you contacted any Aussie, they will tell you the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. There is no opposite rotation, but there is a greater rotation. This is what the astronomical mathematics show. Something to contemplate? Star trails are very pretty, but they prove nothing. Star trails are not a mathematical plot of the sky. The seasons. Did you know the seasons had a reset? When is Midsummer's Day? A simple question? Or is it? Does it matter? Midsummer's Day is about the sun. I'm going to ask you a question. You have three seconds and I would like you to answer it out loud so I can hear you. What colour is the sun in the sky? Did you answer yellow? If you did, you would be among the 98% of people I have personally polled offline over the last seven years. If you answered a red flaming ball, you would be among the 2% of people I have personally polled offline over the last seven years. This question I have found to be of great benefit because it shows just how little people know about the biggest celestial object in the sky and how knowing has been replaced by belief. What colour is the sun in the sky? White ladies and gentlemen, the sun in the sky is white. It has always been white. It is your school books, television, documentaries, etc., etc., etc. Remember, scientists have told you don't look at the sun, don't even peek. It could burn your eyeballs, make you blind, give you skin cancer, and kill you. So there's the disclaimer. So for the information regarding Midsummer's Day. It is the big white celestial object in the sky that we will be interested in. Midsummer's Day. Mid prefix. Mid is used to form nouns or adjectives that refer to the middle part of a particular period of time or the middle point of a particular place. Collins English Dictionary. Midsummer's Day is the day that is in the middle of summer, which of course is the summer solstice. Shakespeare would agree with this. Do you? How about Midwinter's Day? 
the day of the winter solstice. Is this the middle of winter or the beginning of winter? Let's see what an astrophysicist learned. So, so there's that. That was a nice little astronomical event to, to, to bring the year to a close. Uh, so then we have what's going on now. So we're, these are the shortest days of the year in the northern hemisphere, shortest right. uh, length of daylight. And so the sun is what heats Earth. So if on your way into the first day of winter, December 21st, you're getting less and less sunlight. The first day of winter, December 21st, the first day of winter, December 21st. Neil believes this. He teaches this because this is what he was taught. The middle of summer is not the beginning of summer. The middle of winter is not the beginning of winter. This academic reset of the seasons happened long before DeGrasse Tyson was born, long before Carl Sagan was born. We go back to the 1800s at least for this reset. The beginning of winter and the beginning of summer since the 1800s presents in two measures, a meteorological season and the astronomical season. It is the astronomical season that has changed the beginning of winter and the beginning of summer academically to be on the solstices. As I've shown you, astronomy is mathematical and there is no valid mathematical reason to change the middle of winter or the middle of summer to being the first day of these seasons. Why would the people in the 1800s reset the date of the seasons? Why would they need to change anything at all about time? So ladies and gentlemen, this addendum is finished. As you see, I have just summarized each of the topics and volumes definitely could be written on each of these topics. There are things I consider to be a lot bigger to focus on and one of them will be in the next chapter. So until then, my friends, take care and much love to you all.